What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm a few days late to the party on this one, but I'm back with a spoiler-free review for Clint Eastwood's latest movie, Juror Number 2, starring Nicholas Hoult. The movie's currently playing in fewer than 50 theaters in the U.S. with a planned release on Max around Christmas time, but due to my attending the Virginia Film Festival this past week, and I was unable to see the movie until now, in any case, let's just jump right in. Juror Number 2 is a courtroom drama. Not my usual cup of tea, but in that Clint Eastwood is 94 years old, I'm not about to skip the opportunity to comment on what might be the last movie he might make as a director. And I know his fans who have been following his career since Revenge of the Creature in 1955 would like to believe that nothing short of two planets colliding might bring his career to an end, but I think at this point it's safe to say more of his career is behind him than in front of him. So let's just enjoy Clint while we have him. Well, maybe so, Doc, but there were four rats in there when I changed my lights. Now there's only three. It's my considered opinion that rat number four is sitting inside that cat. Now, Juror Number 2 has been getting some very solid reviews, but from my taste, this is one of those movies that's just pretty good. No more, no less. And there's nothing wrong with being merely a pretty good courtroom drama. Made for $35 million, this is one of those mid-range movies that adults always claim they want to see more of if they're tired of like robots and superheroes, etc. However, they rarely seem to support these movies with their dollars. And Conclave is another one of those movies out there right now that's a mid-range movie. I think Conclave is a stronger movie, but if you want to see more movies that don't just feature basically like, you know, adolescent fantasies, well then you have to go to the theater and see these kinds of movies, especially when it might be Clint Eastwood's last movie as a director. However, he says he's starting to read scripts again for whatever his next project will be. So who knows, maybe it will take planets colliding for Clint to stop making movies. But if you've seen the trailer and you have a taste for this kind of cinema, I'll say that the movie features a fantastic ensemble cast, has a ton of professional polish, huge surprise, Clint Eastwood's directed about 40 feature films, so at this point he ought to know how to, how to shoot a movie. And I think the movie leads up to a really satisfying final scene, so for my money, the movie is 100% worth seeing, so if you're lucky enough to live in one of the few cities that's playing the movie and you're curious about the film, definitely check it out while it's in the theater. If not, check it out on Max in December when it gets released in about like six weeks or so. But as far as the story goes, I'm not going to give away any of the plot since obviously the main appeal of this kind of story is like all the twists and turns of the courtroom drama. But here's the basic premise presented in the trailer. Nicholas Hoult plays a loving husband whose wife is expecting a baby any day and he gets selected as a juror in this murder trial where the defendant is accused of beating his girlfriend to death and hurling her body over a bridge where he left her. But there's a slight wrinkle. Nicholas Hould is also a recovering alcoholic who remembers a dark and stormy night where he hit something with his car at the exact same bridge. And at the time he thought maybe he hit a deer, it was too dark, it was too rainy to tell. But now he has to wrestle with his conscience over what is the right thing to, what is the right thing to do. And on top of all this, Tony Collette's playing this prosecuting attorney who's running for district attorney. She needs to get a conviction. She's desperate to win this trial. And J.K. Simmons is a retired detective who's also on the jury. And it's basically all just turning into a big giant shitstorm that more or less kept me in, more or less kept me entertained from start to finish. I wasn't enthralled. But I was engaged and I was interested. And the only times where it kind of lost me was when it tried and failed to recapture the glory of Sidney Lumet's immortal classic, 12 Angry Men, starring Henry Fonda. And as far as I'm concerned, for the rest of my life, anytime I want to see a movie about a murder trial, I'll just watch 12 Angry Men and be gloriously entertained. It's one of those rare movies that I would describe as perfect, where we have the so-called 12 Angry Men debating the details of a particular case. And while it's a little unfair to compare any movie to 12 Angry Men, this is still a Clint Eastwood movie. He can take a little tough criticism, and when the plot of Juror Number 2 inevitably veers into these really heated debates between all the, between all the various jurors with this trial, I found it to be borderline amateur in comparison to City Limits movie, but once again, it's kind of an unfair criticism, but an icon like Clint can and handle a little uh, tough scrutiny. But the rest of the movie plays just fine. Zoe Deutsch does a good job as Nicholas Hult's wife who's pushing him to wrap up all this jury duty bullshit and get back home where she needs him. But for the record, I should add, I'm a big believer in not trying to get out of jury duty. I've been called downtown twice for jury duty since I moved to Manhattan, but I've never been selected. But if I'm ever in trouble, I hope I'm depositing some good karma in the bank by not coming up with some bullshit excuse as to why I'm unfit as a juror, which I've seen a lot of people do where they get really squirrely giving weird answers as they're asked certain questions. But, but getting back to the movie, I also really enjoyed seeing Kiefer Sutherland back in the mix. Leslie Bibb is okay. She tries to make the best of her limited screen time, but uh, Chris Messina is pretty good as Tony Collette's main adversary in court, but also her favorite drinking buddy. And Clint Eastwood's daughter Francesca does a good job in the flashbacks where we see the deceased Kendall Carter and the various events of the evening that led up to her untimely demise. 
So as I said earlier, this is just overall a very solid, entertaining courtroom drama. Not necessarily my cup of tea, not necessarily my go-to. I mean, I much prefer Clint Eastwood's movies like Unforgiven or Play Misty for Me or uh, Mystic River. I mean, he's directed a lot of good movies. This is not necessarily like top-tier Clint Eastwood. Maybe it's not even second-tier Clint Eastwood, but it is a, a Clint Eastwood movie. So if the trailer grabs you, hunt it down the theater, but most people are going to have to wait until December to catch it on Max. But I should pause and acknowledge that there's been a little bit of controversy surrounding Warner Brothers' handling of the film because initially Warner Brothers was being really cagey and secretive about the release where they, they announced that they weren't going to report box office, they were going to have only a few theaters, and they just, they just basically weren't being very forthcoming in all the details surrounding the movie and why it seemed to be getting kind of like this muted release, almost like they were trying to do the bare minimum to satisfy like some contractual obligation, but at the same time kind of being dismissive of this uh, American icon who's been making a lot of money for Warner, Warner Brothers for many, many decades. I mean, his, his association with uh, Warner Brothers goes back to like the late 60s, or at a bare minimum, the, uh, the early 70s. He's been very loyal to Warner Brothers over the years. And every once in a while, one of Clint Eastwood's movies will hit and hit big. Like American Sniper, which admittedly came out 10 years ago, was made for $59 million. It grossed $547 million fucking dollars. I mean, that, that's insane that a Clint Eastwood movie made that kind of money. It's like almost like he made like a goddamn Marvel movie or something like that. But I don't think this movie would have generated massive box office. It was just weird that Warner Brothers was being kind of, um, like I said, secretive about the details. And they still haven't announced what the specific day is on Max that the movie's coming out. I guess a lot of people just felt like it was a little disrespectful to, uh, to Clint Eastwood. And I can see that point of view. And this would be one of many examples in recent years where Warner Brothers has basically sabotaged the relationship with a very successful filmmaker. Like Christopher Nolan now works at Universal. Like he made many movies for Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers pissed him off with the handling of uh, Tenet. And now he made uh, Oppenheimer in his next movie over at Universal. And he's not coming back. I don't know if, we, like, if, if Warner Brothers is that worried about like w what the future might hold for Clint Eastwood's career. I doubt he's got another American sniper in his, po in his back pocket. But it is weird the Warner Brothers just continues to alienate uh, legendary filmmakers who have amassed a massive fan base. Once again, for, for the old timers out there, they've been watching Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood in movies since the mid-fucking 50s. I mean, Eisenhower was still, was still the goddamn president back then. But as far as my own relationship with Clint Eastwood's movies is concerned, I really can't remember where it started. I think I either saw clips of uh, Every Which Way But Loose or Any Which Way You Can on HBO as a little kid. And I was like, what is going on with this guy being such good friends with this uh, orangutan? But I remember like a really clear pivot point where I've been seeing trailers for Unforgiven in the summer where I got my driver's license, it's the same summer where Unforgiven came out. And I, f I remember feeling very grown up that I was driving to the theater to see like, you know, like a big boy movie or a movie for adults, a movie that wasn't geared towards like teenage boys, like something like Universal Soldier or something like that. And I was really into Unforgiven when I first saw it. And then I started going back and watching all of his movies with Sergio Leone and Don Siegel. Although... I think I might have seen, when I was like 13 or 14, a few scenes from Dirty Hair. I remember watching it with my babysitter. My babysitter was just howling with laughter. She just thought the movie was so like intense and extreme and over the top that like you know it just was like she was giving her delight and joy as she was watching it. So I definitely had an early exposure to Dirty Harry. So yeah, it was probably Every Which Way But Loose, then Dirty Harry, then Unforgiven. But he still has tons of movies that I haven't seen. Like as a director, uh, I was talking about this last night with some of my friends online. But during a D and D session, Martin Kessler pointed out that when uh, Clint Eastwood made Unforgiven, a lot of people thought at that time, back in 1991 or 1992, that it was like kind of like him beginning to wrap up his career. But if you look at his career since then, he's made like like 25 movies <laughs> or something insane. He's been incredibly prolific. He's got like 10 musical scores to his name, and like I said, he's directed about 40 movies. I don't know how many movies he's acted in, but... Clint Eastwood. Tightrope. But what's incredible is how Clint Eastwood in his 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s has been far more prolific than most filmmakers are throughout their entire lives. Like, usually by the time you hit your, hit your 60s, like, you know, Hollywood kind of closes the door on you and they kind of like show you the door. And Clinton was like, nope, no thank you. I'm just going to continue making money and earning awards and so on and so forth. And once again, every once in a while, he'll generate a massive hit. So he's, uh, he's earned his opportunities every step of the way. 
But as much as I like him as a director, I have to admit that my favorite movies with uh, Clint Eastwood always tend to be the movies either directed by Don Siegel or those movies directed by Sergio Leone. When I was in college, I must have seen The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly 15, 20 times. Obviously, Fistful of Dollars and For a Few Dollars More are fucking fantastic as well. But with Don Siegel, I mean, you've got so many good ones. Obviously, Dirty Harry's just a goddamn Hall of Fame fucking masterpiece, and it holds up insanely well. But like Escape from Alcatraz is really good. Like he and Don were just really good buddies and had, had an incredible working relationship. I think they made like seven or eight movies together. So quick correction on that. I'm seeing right here online that uh, Don Siegel directed Clint Eastwood five times. He did Coogan's Bluff, which fucking rules. Two Mules for Sister Sarah. Good movie, but not necessarily as good as uh, something like Dirty Harry. Did The Beguiled, which I really like. And once again, Escape from Alcatraz is like a, a late career masterpiece for Don Siegel. It's really fucking good. And if you want to see Clint, I mean, everybody talks about the Man With No Name trilogy. If you want to see Clint, you know, communicating volumes with very little and being very silent. It's almost like a silent movie for like half the running time. And I liked how with uh, Unforgiven, Clint, uh, he, I think at the very end of the movie, was directed or dedicated to uh, Sergio and Don, and uh, yeah, it was very fitting. He got to work with two of the, uh, the filmmaking giants of the 60s and 70s, and he learned a hell of a lot. But as a director, Clint Eastwood, is, uh, he's no slouch himself. I'm just going to have a quick glance on IMDb of all of his movies as a director, and I won't claim to have seen every single movie that he's directed. There are still a ton of uh, blind spots that I have, but I really like Mystic River. I really like A Perfect World. I really like Unforgiven. I like Bird. I mean, Clint Eastwood is a giant jazz you know, aficionado, and you're just totally fucking obsessed. Sudden Impact is good. Bronco Billy's good. The Gauntlet's an absolute blast. Just for that Frank Frazetta painting alone, it's worth hunting down. Outlaw Josie Wales is definitely one of his best, even if he kind of stole the movie from Philip Kaufman, who had uh, who'd started as a director, and Clint kind of pushed him aside because Clint likes fewer takes and uh, short shooting days. You know, he's famous for being very economical, coming in under budget. I'm always like one of those guys that's like, Clint, maybe slow down and do a few more takes, and you won't have clumsy uh, courtroom drama scenes like you have in Juror Number 2. But there's a famous quote about Clint Eastwood's approach, and I can't remember the exact words, but he basically has like a hypothetical scenario where you're trying to uh, get a shot of a bridge, and there are two kinds of approaches that filmmakers can employ. Like, you know, a practical filmmaker, if the shot's not working, will move the camera, but there are plenty of other directors who will try and move the bridge. And Clint's always been one of those guys who will try and move the camera. He's very quick, very efficient, but it also means that sometimes those movies feel like um, they could have used a little bit more time in the oven. But he's also got the Iger Sanction, with really, which I really like. But High Plains Drifter is a wild western, well worth hunting down. And Play Misty for me, I mean, as a directorial debut, it's an, a dynamite little thriller, and it's like imbued with all of Clint Eastwood's love and affection for jazz music. He plays a, uh, a jazz DJ in the movie, and he's going to like to jazz festivals and that sort of thing. But anyway, cool thriller, but also tons of great music as well. And I realize this video is kind of spiraling out of control and it's no longer really a juror number two review. It's more of just like a, a, a love letter to uh, Clint Eastwood. But I'm looking forward to seeing more of his movies. Like I've never seen Breezy from 1973, which he directed with William Holden. I need to hunt that down. And uh, one of my great sources of shame in my life is that when I was 10 years old, I had a brief encounter where I got to meet Clint Eastwood but I didn't know who Clint Eastwood was. So I didn't get to like soak it in and savor it, but my family was at a ski resort in Idaho and Clint was at a restaurant and everybody was kind of giving him his distance, but my stepdad, who was a Clint Eastwood fanatic, was like, y'all need to go over and introduce yourselves and blah, blah, blah. So my brothers and sisters and I, we all went over there. Once again, none of us knew who the fuck Clint Eastwood was. And we started saying, we, we tried to introduce ourselves and Clint just kind of kept eating his dinner, kind of raised his head and kind of nodded. And it was either like his agent or his manager, but he took down our address and he sent us uh, autographed headshots, which sadly I've lost in the interim. So I at least got to like share the same oxygen as Clint Eastwood when I was 10 years old. But once again, it would be a few more years before I could really understand what the, uh, what the big deal was about Clint Eastwood. But what I'm realizing is that what I really want to do is a big, giant video on the career of Clint Eastwood. And that would be a tough one to do because he's got just so much work to his name. He's got 55 movies as a producer, 73 movies as an actor, 45 movies as a director, 33 movies as involved with the soundtrack, 10 movies as a composer. I mean, I, I, maybe what I, what I should do is like a video where I do my top 10 favorite Clint Eastwood movies where he's the director. And then a video where I do my top 10 favorite movies where Clint Eastwood is just an actor. That's probably a more manageable uh, assignment. But in that, once again, he's 94 years old. I don't know how much longer he's going to be with us. It's time for me to start kind of 
prepping and planning for my uh, R.I.P. Clint Eastwood. But I hope he lives to be 150. I doubt that he will, but uh, you never know. Uh, I mean, he, he's been, I mean, he's, once again, he's been making movies for almost 70 fucking years. It's almost impossible to imagine a, uh, a filmmaking, uh, you know, landscape without Clint Eastwood. If you were to add up all the years that movies have even been a thing on this planet, Clint Eastwood has been active in the industry for more than half of it. Movies have been around since more or less like 1895, so that's like, what, like 129 years? And Clint's been making movies for 69 years of that, if my math is correct. So once again, yeah, for more than half of the lifespan of the entire art form, Clint Eastwood has been making movies, and good ones every step of the way. But I think for the time being, it's time for me to wrap up this video before I completely spiral out of control and just start rambling and ranting like a goddamn idiot. But to be continued on Clint in the uh, the months and years to come because I'm going to have a lot more to say about his career. And also, I still have a lot more research to do about his career as well. But definitely check out Jura number two if you want to see more courtroom dramas and more movies geared toward adults. Or definitely check it out if you want to let Clint Eastwood that uh, his fans are still out there. They still love and adore his work. But... Hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting the notification bell, leaving a comment below, all that good stuff. I would greatly appreciate it. But I'll be back at y'all later this week to review season two of Arcane. And hopefully I'll have a few more uh, surprises in my back pocket. I just gotta, I gotta put on my thinking cap and think what, what, what my next video is gonna be. But thanks again for watching. I greatly appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.